Okay, uh, can I have your attention? So I would like to introduce uh, Samuel uh, Valenzi, our next keynote speaker. Samuel Valenzi is an author and director. He founded the company La Poursuite du Bleu. He committed to environmental and other broad social issues. Since 2019, he has been actively contributing to the reports of the think tank The Shift Project, founded by Jean-Marc Jancovici. He conducts research and documentation work on the environmental transition in culture. His task now will be to put clear figures on the energy climate issues in general for the performing arts in particular, and to present us with the um, to present us the recommendations for action of the remarkable work he directed for the Schiff project. Um, je suis plus petit que. I am smaller than Herman. Uh, in English this morning, so I will speak in French for uh, <laughs> the rest of the the rest of the speech. And I would like to thank very much the translators here and also all the person uh, responsible for these amazing organizations and the uh, brain juice we're having all together. Thank you so much for that. It's uh, an amazing opportunity. Five years ago, uh, all of you would have been Ali and in France uh, to talk about uh, transition in culture. What? But nowadays I can think uh, that uh, we are all engaged and feel responsible and feel that we have uh, a role to play. So, so thank you for so much for the organization of this and for being here, uh, sharing these moments together. Je vais commencer par vous dire que du coup... So I will start to say first that I'm an author and a director. I'm the founder of the La Poursuite du Bleu, which is very committed to the topic we are speaking about today. And after a few years studying in a, a trade, trade school um, where I was really bored and I was uh, fired from it because uh, the teachers uh, didn't like uh, how I behaved. After that, I had a job in the digital industry. I had an open-ended contract. And uh, after that, uh, I decided to uh, quit my job. It was on the 30th of March, 2020. So very useful to have such a good, um, such a good guts about the future. So I had a lot of free time and as an artist, I had a lot of free time. And the Shift Project is an organization to enlighten the public about uh, climate and the carbon transition. So they asked me to come and uh, give them a hand uh, for the reduction of a transformation plan for the French economy. So engineers are very uh, creative when uh, they draft a title for such a project. So I was charged to work on culture, on the whole cultural sector, but I was not the only one. We were a whole team working on this project. And we defined quite uh, important stakes. I had to work two weeks on this, and now it's been 94 weeks. So if the shift project comes to you for a two weeks assignment, then you know how it goes. So I worked uh, for the shift project and my uh, company, La Poursuite du Bleu, and I'm also teaching at the ICARD, uh, a school uh, where I teach. And I'm also teaching at uh, Dauphine. So it's important for us in my company to train uh, the future actors in this industry. So the first part of my industry is uh, going to raise your consumption of uh, paracetamol, of painkillers. It will not be very positive. I will try to add a bit of humor to make it more positive, but we have to keep in mind that this is a problem. So what we are talking about is not necessarily very, very pleasant. So I will first define something. What is energy? This is what quantifies the amount of transformation in an environment. 
you need energy to change the composition of an element to change the speed of uh, something moving when you push the accelerator you need fuel when you need to heat a place you need energy and this is a unit to measure this transformation we are very worried with this energy because uh, this energy comes from our environment and uh, nothing is created nothing is lost all is changing this is the evolution of our energy consumption since 1900 so what you see in blue and orange are fossil energies um, they take a lot of time to uh, change you have to wait uh, 10 to 200 billion sorry million years to have gas or fuel again so these are renewable energies i insist on this graph because we are not in an energy transition we are in an energy addition we are adding new sources of energy what to uh, existing energy sources and uh, the energy source consumption that increased the most are oil and coal so this is what the graph says and this graph also says the amount of transformation that we introduce in our environment because this is what energy energy is um, is showing so this is the role of the energy to transform our environment and there is no clean energy we will speak about it later so here you see the evolution of the diameter of the earth it has not changed we are consuming increasingly more energy to tra increasingly transform our environment in a planet which diameter does not change it has always been always been 13 um, thousand kilometers so the more we consume the more our gdp grows Grows and the more we have uh, um, oceans, edifications, so the more we have carbon dioxide in our environment, etc., etc. So we are using energy to measure the transformation of our environment, but our environment is stable. But we transform more and more our environment by using more and more energy. So um, there are a lot of transformation of transformations of our environment that are not very pleasant to us and the least pleasant is climate change so before um, greenhouse gas emissions helped to keep our climate stable but now we are adding uh, greenhouse gases to uh, the atmosphere and it changes so we add uh, co2 ch4 so methane uh, which comes from the remnants uh, the rice paddies etc we also add nitrogen which comes from um, the chemical industry and there are also cooling cases uh, which is also why the World Cup in Qatar is not the priority today so what we have to um, understand with these greenhouse gases is that they remain very in a very long time in the atmosphere I mean they remain for a very long time so 10% of uh, the gases uh, today will remained we will remain in the environment for uh, 10,000 years so if you had to, uh, to 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 have a debt today for the environment you would avoid adding any more greenhouse gases because greenhouse gases are cumulative they add to one another so i was saying earlier that i would uh, give you good news so here you see today the difference in greenhouse gases in terms of warming effect. You see uh, methane, CH4, is 25% more warming on 100 years um, as CO2. And uh, nitrogen is even more. So this is also why the IPCC says that um, decreasing our um, red meat consumption is important to decrease the amount of methane we send in the environment so here it's just to give you an idea and the more we emit um, 
CO2, the more our climate warms. So if we start this red trajectory, we will come to a four point or a five degree Celsius in temperature increase. And if we follow this uh, blue path, we are staying at 1.5 degrees. So you see, the more we wait, the higher the uncertainty level is. Apparently, um, one third of the, the surface of the Earth will be uh, inhabitable if we, there is a far four degrees uh, temperature increase. Um, if we have plus three degrees, uh, there is there will be a lot of instability and therefore the army will take control in most of the countries. At even plus two degrees, you see in the red zones, uh, I advise you not to invest in uh, in the, in a house or in um, in dwelling in this in these areas so you see these areas will be covered by water and you don't want to spend your holidays there so this is not in pakistan it's not so far away in time and uh, in space it's tomorrow in our countries so what about your painkiller consumption i'm just checking so abundant energy until when? You know that the more we consume energy, the more we transform our environment. And among these not very pleasant transformations, there is global warming. But there is another problem. These energies, which take a lot of time to, um, to be created, they are becoming scarce. So since 2008, oil in Saudi Arabia or in other uh, oil producing country, it is dis decreasing. So this is also why we are um, searching for oil uh, in, in other ways. But uh, these oil reserves are also decreasing. Saudi Arabia, because it, before it was requested to increase uh, its oil production announced its peak uh, for 2027. So um, the amount of fuel that we will have will become scarce. And uh, the figures announced by Reichstadt and other agencies uh, says that our peak will happen in 2030 for oil producing countries. So this is not a matter of whether we will do our transition that we should call a transformation, rather. This transformation will happen. The only question that we ask here today during the workshops is how are we going to transform our economy? So this is a summary of our uh, activities, so quite joyful activities. All of our activities are uh, subject to this double carbon bind and it leads to behaviors that we have to uh, maintain. So we have to respect the Paris Agreement, which means uh, decreasing our um, energy consumption. And uh, there are different ways to do it. So the trajectory of the Paris Agreement are two degrees. So we are limited to 3,000 gigatons by 20. Uh, 100. So this is one tenth of what our grandparents emitted. So this is a big challenge. At an individual scale, but uh, this is a very flawed, a very flawed approach. But if we do this on an individual scale, so this is um, going from uh, about 10 tons of CO2 per year to two tons of CO2 per year. So we have to change our way of uh, doing our daily activities and our public services. So we need a plan. I hope that things will happen this way, but because without a plan, um, we will miss all targets. So we'll explain. You have three ways to decrease the uh, energy consumption of your car. The first one is ask the constructor of your car to make sure that your car 
consumes less. So uh, this is called energy e efficiency. So the cars will be more performant and will consume less. So this is possible to organize. Second option, change the use. So you reinvent uh, your relation to your car. So you say, I don't need my car all the time. I can share it with my neighbors. You can do that. Third option, our president spoke about benevolent um, sobriety. It does not mean anything. So involuntary sobriety is poverty. If you are uh, sober voluntarily, that means not using your car anymore. So this is the transition that is ahead of us. So we need a plan. The work of the shift is uh, related to climate. So this is also why I'm speaking about CO2. This is an imperfect index because tomorrow, if we build a low carbon bulldozer, I think that we have not really understood what it means. So you understand that it is an imperfect meter. It just indicates about the, it just indicates the quantity of con of, car of energy that we can use. It's just a tool to enable us to think about uh, what we need to do in culture and other se sectors, of course. When we started our work on the impact of culture, we heard, oh, culture, it's not very important. It's only 2.3% of GDP. It's just uh, uh, 600 jobs. And 60,000 jobs, rather. I think we all understood that these last few years. So cutting the words in different parts is very Cartesian, but it does not tell us about the interactions between the different parts of the world. It does not um, deals with the fact that uh, all sectors interact. GDP, um, sorry, tourism is 8% uh, of the GDP in in our country, in France. But um, without culture, what is left with uh, with um, with tourism and uh, and the the digital? What is left without culture? I will tell you, it's just pornography, and uh, pornography is just video. But it's another topic. And if we think about transport, it's also very important. So whatever the perspective that we have, we come to the conclusion that culture has to change. The shift project and the work I will present here is, is very similar to um, what uh, Julie's bicycle does. So we have to turn data into physical uh, flows to understand uh, the relationship between culture and CO2. So you see, culture here in this graph is not so very relevant. So it must be maybe in leisure activities or in sport uh, and culture here. So not so very important. I also want to tell you that we need to do this transformation because our resources are becoming scarce. So in France, you have uh, six, 600,000 or 700,000 people working full-time, but there are also people working part-time. If there are shocks and if we are not prepared to a transition, we are uh, going to have part-time unemployment. The work I want to show you and what we did at the SHIFT project uh, is about interrelations and interdependency. Culture is uh, the third cause of mobility uh, for French, so culture and leisure activities. Uh, before that, uh, there is work as first cause and uh, then uh, um, other le shopping, grocery shopping. So maybe you think, oh, culture and leisure activities is just going to the stadium and see a football match, but it's more than that. Every time we produce data, 
for the shift project, we uh, do our work based on data that we find online. So we don't um, draw the lessons of uh, the, the carbon footprint of an event, but uh, uh, we we also uh, try to assess the carbon footprint of uh, the whole event and the, the spectators as well. So we can uh, say, okay, there are there is that amount of uh, people who attended and uh, uh, they consumed that much food. Oh, I see that uh, these calculations do not impress you. Uh, they are not very interesting for you. So just what I wanted to say is that uh, from the data you can find online, you can do some estimates. Here you can see an estimate on the transport of festival goers. And you can see that for the transport, uh, the highest emission um, point is uh, um, transport but we are zooming in the transport of festival goers now are you ready 60 percent of these emissions are due to the three percent of festival goers who fly to come to a festival so you know uh, during the crisis we continued not to tax kerosene but still to tax uh, the petrol for people who needed to take the car to go to work so you see most of the time, when you look at data, you can see inequalities of use. So the more the spectators are far, the farer they are, uh, the more their consumption increases. And it has an influence on greenhouse gases. So here you can see uh, the um, anonymized assessment carbon assessment of a national scene, so their, their situation is not very good. And you can see that for transport, it's 37%, uh, and it's mostly transport, which is the uh, highest carbon emitter here. Also for broadband, it is also a big emitter, and you could also add the lives on social networks, which uh, must be also um, very relevant and uh, very numerous, but you can see there are different uses. And this is before we increase and multiply our data used by 50, 150, um, when we start the metaverse. When you look at buildings and energy, I will show you again this carbon assessment that I showed you before. So there is a huge energy uh, spending post, which is the building. So it was um, um, several years ago. And uh, the CSR manager there said, oh, we have to change something. And now we see that uh, there is an increase in prices for energy and uh, there will be um, an, a decrease in resources. So in Mulhouse, at the Filature, um, a theater, the gas and um, the energy bill of uh, this theater is increasing. It, it's uh, 500,000 euros. So what can they do? Suppress the CSR manager um, position because the person is leaving the company. Um, and uh, so they will not be replaced. So this is how they will decrease the bill. So you can see it's a problem. Now there is a picture of uh, the Dijon Opera. Uh, I visited it no, not so long ago. Um, the architect designed it so that it looks like a piano from the sky. I'm not very convinced. But what you can see on the left of uh, the grass has been designed without any use in mind. So you have to warm this place that is not useful at all. And to warm up this space uh, costs a huge amount of energy. And uh, the most surprising is that uh, the Dijon, Dijon inhabitants have no idea that uh, this building looks like a piano from the sky. 
on big events, you can also see that food is a very important post, energy consumption post. You can see that for the Festival des Vieilles Charrues, um, there is 1,830 um, tons of uh, CO2 equivalent. So it's uh, it means a lot of flights. But if we changed the food consumption in this uh, festival, we could also boost the energy transition in this territory. So what I meant is that if we consume fossil energies that transform the environment, and if they also change the climate, and if they are also becoming scarce, it will disappear. And if we have to change our transports, mobility, buildings, industry, uh, energy consumption, or digital uses, I'm sorry for the speed uh, um, for the translator, we will have to change our culture. So, again, Tourism Aid, as we said, we were talking about the carbon assessment, which is imperfect. But let's look at this little Parisian museum that you may know. Uh, its uh, assessment is 4 million um, CO2 ton equivalent. I think it is the biggest, um, the highest amount. And it's really interesting because this amount comes, um, and, and I quote, apparently from uh, the visitors from China and the US. That would be the main source of carbon emission. Why I want to talk about this small museum is because we're talking about here international cooperation. Of course, we still have to be interested in international um, work and working together, but it is a big source of carbon emission. Le Louvre, um, this museum, is the museum that has um, gotten the highest amount of money to deal with the health crisis, which is quite interesting because it had uh, less visitors, of course, because of the health crisis. So we need the government to help us face all different crises. So there's always more risks because we need more physical flows and we're um, dependent on people coming from far away. Here you can see um, Les Vieilles Charrues, a well-known festival in Brittany between 96 and 2019. Such a growth in physics, they call that an instable growth. Here, the Hellfest that you probably know. Um, what you see on the far right is the theoretical new world. And uh, because I like to joke, here's We Love Green. We're not the best at measuring the risks that we face. Some of my students have led um, a study on this topic a couple of years ago. And the idea of that, um, of that study was to ask the professional of this um, a sector if they had a training um, in corporate social responsibility. See the answer, mainly no. So if we um, ask the question now, less waste, um, do you think that less waste is going to help with climate change? You see here the answer um, is yes. We know a lot of festivals have worked very hard on this um, on this question, which is good, but the answer is that actually it doesn't make that much of a difference. It's great for um, many things, of course, for uh, the quality of air and the quality of the soil as well, but is not enough for us to meet the Agreement of Paris. So, how do we change culture? This is why we're here. This is the main question. So there's two main axes of transformation. And we'll come to the um, real measurement tools later, but I want to show you these two possible trajectories. As I was telling, uh, I was, Chiara was telling us earlier, there's many, many students, uh, 40 million students that come out of um, their studies, 40,000, excuse me, um, every year that want to work in the cultural sector. So these people need to be trained. 
So if, these, if we train these people while they're studying, as well as um, ongoing training, once they've already started to work, we can really change something. In the region of Paris, there is an ecological bonus for directing work. And if you make um, the right choices and make intelligent decisions, then you can get some money from the region. But the question is, who decides who gets these bonuses? Well, I can tell you it's just some person in office. Even when they are um, directing and working um, on, uh, on a very well-known French series, L'Effondrement, that deals with these questions, um, they wouldn't go vegan, even though that would have been a solution. And in cities where it is a big topic, like Rennes, for example, we let people make their own assessment, and then we see, depending on these assessments, if we give them bon bonuses or not. So without training, I don't think we can really go further with this transformation. So here are the main uh, levers. And I want to try and be optimistic now because I want to cheer you up. So I'm going to give you some practical examples of each of those levers. So when we talk about relocating, we talk about La Colline, the National Theatre, where for um, many, many years they had um, storage buildings in Normandy. But uh, when we measure the um, carbon impact of uh, this storage unit, it is also about how much is, um, how many cars does it need, how many vehicles, how many kilometers, and how much weight and mass is being driven around. So we do have to think about that. So what this theater has done is that they brought back the storage unit um, and storage building they had in Normandy back into town, into Paris, so that they wouldn't have to drive so far to get it. We keep talking about relocating. We'll speak about Jérôme Bell in his company. There are no planes anymore. I think you know about that. Jérôme Bell has decided to film um, rehearsals and to send these videos to choreographers and dancers on other continents. In France, in the US, in Asia, either way, um, the tours are made um, via rail. Of course, there's many things we could criticize about the work of Jérôme Bell, but from what I know of my work with him is since he has made that decision, I know that his uh, carbon imprint has lowered by 99% and his shows have never toured more. And I asked him if he didn't want to tour as well and go around and he said, no, you never know the author of a piece. You've played Steinbeck, but you've never met him, so you don't need him to be there. Keep, so we keep talking about relocalization and relocating. Um, here there is um, a question of eco-design at the Aquarium Theatre as well in Paris. Um, they rehabilitated their workshop to make it a recovery centre where people could eco-design on the base of um, what was already there. Here we have my company. Uh, between January and April of next year, you will come and see my new production and my new show. I know that. And then when you'll come, you will be given this little piece of paper. You can either put it um, in your garden to plant it, or you can trade it in um, some um, organic um, stores around your house or around the theater, rather, where you can um, exchange it for produces <laughs> or um, maybe... Um, price reductions. So the idea is that we work with people. These um, these shops and the people, the managers are interested because obviously they're going to get more people coming to buy from them. And um, through that, more people know about our show. And it's just um, here a good a good way of exchanging. I've talked um, as well quite a lot about slowing down because I do think it is a key principle and I think we will uh, have no other choice. If you have one liter of um, gas in your car and you want to go the furthest, you will have to go slow. 
which is why um, it's, I think, obvious that we just need to slow down, do less. If we go to the Maison des Métallos, the house of the metal workers, um, you have to create a relationship, create a link. You have to work with the um, um, local organization, but you don't have to produce a show. And it's a really interesting way of seeing our way of working. I think is a real question for our future. I think it's not, it's not intelligent, even though I still do it sometimes to just drive somewhere, go somewhere really far away, um, play my show once and then go back home. It makes no sense. Here, Organic Orchestra, it's a company that I want to talk to you about. They stay in one department, in one um, region, and then they have at least eight dates and they will go around uh, via bike. So their um, carbon impact is about the same as your oven being on for one hour. There is an Eco design there as well regarding the set that comes uh, that that fits into um, the bikes so they can be carried around. And so the idea is that the the artists move rather than the audience, and that is really interesting when we talk about lowering the emissions. I can't talk about each and every. Um, um, each and every experience in detail because it's obvious, but obviously if you drive uh, via bike, you lower your emissions. And it's also a way to think, to rethink the way your sets are made and how you can use them more than once. Thierry Leonardi will probably tell you much more about that and be able to tell you um, very interesting things about that. He has um, helped funded the tool Ideos that is used at the uh, Lyon Opera House, which helps to assess the carbon imprint of each set and its impact as well on the human health. Is it true? Yeah. I don't want to be here and stand like the one who's understood everything because it's not true. It's not what I'm saying. In my own company, we've made many mistakes when we started to uh, dabble in eco-design. The third first thing we said, which really looked like a great idea on paper, was only biosourced um, sets. Nothing new. Um, we would buy nothing and that would be the way to go. We made a beautiful um, set out of wood, but it weighed over three tons and we couldn't move it around. Since then, what we've decided to do with my set designer is that what you can see there, it's three meters high, but everything uh, can be taken down to uh, the smallest format that fits in a normal van. So we just try to have the smallest set, or at least a, a set that can come down to a really small format so we can drive it around in a with a small vehicle. And we want it to be... Um, we want it not to weigh too much as well. And that has helped us uh, to divide our emissions by 10. Um, I'll go quite fast. This is me again. Out of the 1,500 companies that will um, take part of our mobility challenge, those are 1,500 companies that go to the Avignon Festival, and they're all on the same railway on the same rail tracks, sorry. So the idea would be to pool the resources on uh, and to use these rail tracks that are um, would be useful to everybody so that not no one has to um, rely on their own vehicles, also that less there's less danger on the roads with so many people on the roads and it's cheaper and it's better and it's lower emissions. Of course, we will have to give up and renounce some of our practices like streaming We've been told that digital is a tool, but it is just a tool. It can be used well. But what would be really interesting would be to say we're talking about performing arts in French, living arts, so we need living people here in front of us. Uh, the idea is not to add more consumption online via digital streaming. I would. There's a lot of things I would like to say about the digital component. Camille knows that, but I don't have enough time. There's also many festivals that try to have all their artists come via train. Some artists uh, um, to come to this festival, the Pioche um, 
Le Circus Soleil. Um, some artists drove 24 hours, over 24 hours via train to come to this festival. I would like to give you a good um, um, example of a festival that lowers its capacity, so less festival goers, but no festival is doing that, obviously. We have a good example of what we don't want to do at the Hellfest Festival, because it only grows and it can be a big risk. So how can we make it that this huge event becomes maybe um, several smaller events? We're talking here about a region that couldn't use water for the um, agriculture, but that used um, water sprayer and mister for the festival goers at the Festival Hellfest. So it is a um, big contradiction. So we're going to talk now about uh, the measurements. When we talk about the transition, transformation, people talk to us about costs and want to give solutions. It doesn't have to be too costly. There is the question of what we can do today, what we can do alone, what we can do with the support of um, uh, the general public and the politics and things that have to take much more time. So, for example, going vegetarian or vegan is one option. It will lower um, extremely your emissions, it doesn't change anything to your work, and it divides the emissions, the carbon emissions, by 10. Um, and it costs nothing. It is an identity cost, a habit cost. It changes you and the way you live. But the cost for a structure of going vegetarian or vegan is zero. Maybe there's a cost. I do have more energy after lunch. Now let's talk about these positive transformation. So transparent, um, transparent, Transformation was going vegan or vegetarian. And then a positive transparent transformation would be also going uh, organic and local. It's the same idea when we say that all the sets of um, these 1,100 companies will go to the Avignon Festival via train. I never remember if the, the goal is France 2030 or 2035, but it could help. Now we talk about defensive transformation. Defensive transformation are for things that are harsh and intense. Let's come back to the met metaverse and virtual reality. A movie in virtual reality um, consumes 160 um, times more data than a normal movie on YouTube. And that does, just does not work and does not fit within the Paris Agreement. Then we have deep, um, deep transformation. So offensive transformations like lowering the capacity of my festival, so less people coming, less festival goers. We've assessed this big festival, this theoretical um, uh, festival. Um, try to go use all these solutions, so going uh, vegan or vegetarian, uh, coming via train, etc. We can see, depending on how many of these transformations we use, the uh, difference in emissions is not always very impressive. So first one uh, you can see with minus 20% was with just transparent and positive measures, so via, uh, for example, going vegan. Then the second one going almost down by 50% with all the four measures, transparent, offensive, defensive, and positive. This is the least we need to do to be able to meet the Paris Agreement. And then the last one was with um, lowering the capacity. And here we can see a study that we did with um, the um, Parisian Accords and Agreement, sorry, and with the government, where we can see that many people say they're ready to change the models of production and distribution. It is a systemic problem that requires a systemic solution. If someone comes to you with a simple solution, go away. 
you're going to gain a lot of time. And again, if it's a nice discussion, a pleasant discussion, it's not the right one. Because if we have the right discussions, then we're talking about changing, changing the way we work. And if we do talk about changing our work, there will be friction, there will be arguments. It's not easy. It's not easy to change. It's easy to go vegetarian, but it's not easy to give up the way you've been uh, living until now. So again, I said, if it's a pleasant discussion, it's because everybody is just too conciliant or because you're not actually talking about the right topic because we're asking people to change their ways that they've been living for 20, 30 or 40 years. After that comes the joy. After that comes the pleasant discussion. You'll have, uh, I'll, I'll give you the recipe to my vegetarian lasagna. You'll see it's amazing. I'll show you how to have a, a great set that you can fold down to a small format. It's amazing. But the time where you change, where you have to make these decisions, it's not easy. Think about the future of artists who live these low carbon emission lives and produce these shows. It's amazing. It is possible.